good afternoon or good evening to all the European friends and of course all the people who have uh, joined us for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Miguel Moratinos, uh, the High Representative of the United Nations Alliance of Civilization, but uh, I think I um, ask uh, to organize this uh, encounter. Uh, it was an idea that uh, our friend uh, Enrico Letta, the Dean of the PSIA, offered me when uh, he knew that I had just published a book about my Mission de Paix au Proche Orient. It was last uh, January. And uh, he thought, well, why we don't share your views and experience of European role in the Middle East with some uh, Palestinian, Israeli friends and Americans in order to really debate uh, the responsibility and role and uh, engagement of Europe towards the this process in, in this region. So I'm not going to make the publicity of my book, uh, but uh, I want really to thank uh, and uh, welcome all the students, my old student that has been, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, attending some of my courses in the theory and practice of diplomacy in CIA. And I think also, of course, uh, I want to thank Marie-Zinaï Jolis, the, the, the one who really facilitates uh, the reality that today we can have this, uh, this meeting. Thank you, Marie-Zinaï, for all your work and your, uh, the organization tasks you have performed so well. So I cannot start my um, uh, introductory remark without uh, paying homage and tribute to one of my best friends, my brother, Saeb Erekat. Uh, you know, Saeb Erekat has died today at the age of 65 years old. He was the chief negotiator of the Palestinians for many years. Uh, still the last uh, 13 of October, I received a SMS from him. Uh, he has got the COVID. And unfortunately, he departed today. So I'm writing myself an obituary. And uh, my conclusion is that, of course, I think we have to commit all of us, the ones who are really committed to peace, to really follow his pace and his uh, uh, heritage in order that we can achieve a lasting peace between Palestine and Israel. So my dear Saib, I think you will be very happy to listen to all of us and uh, we will have a, a great thought about your personal uh, engagement to world peace in the region. So my role is to really introduce the, the subject and to introduce the panelists. I will first introduce the, I will think, uh, very prestigious panelists to this uh, webinar. Uh, first, uh, Deborah Wheeler. Uh, professor of Chicago University is teaching in the Ana uh, Annapolis Naval Academy. Uh, maybe you were there, uh, Deborah, when we were all the delegation, I think uh, 13 years ago in 2007. I think the Annapolis Conference was the last uh, attempt uh, to have a kind of uh, international conference to bring peace between Israel and Palestinians. And uh, I think uh, you will give us, uh, you know, the sense of what the uh, US and European Union can do together and how, you know, for the American perspective should be the role of uh, Europe in, in this uh, difficult region. Uh, the second panelist is my dear friend, Eli Barnaby. I think uh, many, many, hours, uh, years uh, we've been together, sharing our friendship and uh, engagement toward peace. Eddie, uh, of course, in Israeli, but he's a European. I don't think we could have found somebody so much close to Europe uh, culture and Europe uh, identity that Eli. He was uh, Israeli ambassador to Paris. Uh, and he'd been uh, some man committed to peace and uh, trying to really overcome the obstacles and having always a very honest and very sincere relationship with his Palestinian uh, counterpart. So uh, he's been um, continuing fighting for a peace settlement in the region. He's been the, the soul and the inspiration to organize uh, 
a museum de l'Europe, a European museum uh, that really have a, a very imaginative way to work and uh, he or, organized a, a very interesting and very, I would say, timely uh, exhibition about Islam in Europe, uh, something that coming from an uh, Israeli man is uh, something that show the way to understand better the other and to understand how we can uh, work together. And finally, we have my dear friend Elia Sambar, a poet, a, a man of, uh, of uh, tremendous culture, uh, that is, of course, the representative of the Palestine in the UNESCO. It had been, uh, well, you read uh, how many books, how many uh, uh, contributions have made during all his life. It's a man also of dialogue, of uh, strong commitments, a strong principle, ideals. But I think we need that. We need uh, to maintain your own uh, commitment in order that uh, when you come to a final compromise, your uh, rights are well defended, are well understood and you can't really overcome the difficulties that are normally and unfortunately exposed in this uh, public uh, uh, discussion and debate. So uh, that's are the panelists. What we are going to discuss, my dear friend, today. Uh, I think uh, many people said before what I'm going to say before me, that you cannot understand uh, the Middle East or what we should call the Near East for us, European or Latin American, of course we are closer to them, uh, without Europe. And you cannot understand Europe without uh, being part of uh, this uh, history and geography of the Middle East. Uh, Middle East is not um, a neighborhood. I refuse this concept, it's more than that. It's not because we are geographically neighbor that we have to take some interest to what is happening in this part of the world. It's more than that. It's history, it's our thinking, it's our way to, know, to react to what has been our life throughout uh, many centuries. And so it's uh, impossible to imagine um, uh, Europe without having a reflection and engagement with his own, uh, let's say, uh, cradle of a civilization that inspires so many. Even the etymology of Europe, Europe, you Arab, Arab is, uh, you know, uh, coming from a Semitic origin. And so um, even our name come from this uh, so-called Levant, uh, this part of the world. So uh, the first uh, assessment for me that Europe cannot ignore, cannot be, you know, uh, passive, what is going on in this uh, part of himself. And that I think is what I, I will reivindicate and I will say during all my intervention and uh, my personal engagement to this part of the region. It is true like uh, General de Gaulle uh, said in his first visit to the region, uh, and I quote, uh, I'm flying to a complex region with uh, uh, simple ideas. And it is true, sometimes we uh, European, we Westerner, we come to try to analyze what is going on in between Israel and Palestine, or between Arabs and Israelis in this uh, complex Middle East with certain, uh, let's say, um, simple formulas. We don't want to go to the root causes. We don't try to understand the other. And so the complexity makes us to be afraid and sometimes to get out of the conflict because we come to a certain uh, fatalist attitude that, uh, well, there will be no way to make peace in this part of the world. So um, that is also something that Europeans should really try to uh, invest in. I mean, we have uh, been uh, close to and been part of that. We have to try to understand the complexity of the problem in order that we can give some advice or some guidance to our friends that at the end of the day are the one who have to take the main important decision. Uh, European, uh, the recent history of the Middle East uh, had a uh, 
show, I think, the road to peace in many occasions. And I think uh, we had a certain um, highlights and certain dates that show how Europe has contributed or have tried to contribute to a peaceful solution in this region. Uh, this year is the 20th anniversary of the Venice Declaration 1980 when uh, the Foreign Minister of Italy, Andreotti, uh, in Venice uh, decided to recognize the right of Palestinian to self-determination. Can you imagine 1980 uh, to already uh, ask for uh, respect and uh, support of the Palestinian right to self-determination? Then, of course, we were talking uh, about the Madrid Peace Conference. Uh, my friend Saber Ekati in 1991, already 29 years ago. Next year will be 30 years since the Madrid Peace Conference. Then, it's not because me, but in 1996, the European Union wants to really be much more politically present in the conflict and decide to appoint a EU special envoy to the Middle East peace process. They appointed me after the very negative visit of uh, President Chirac uh, to Jerusalem. And then 1999, we have uh, signed uh, Europeans, the so-called Berlin Declaration, that will say that the Europeans will uh, recognize the state of Palestine in due course. So the due course maybe has come uh, to, to a moment today. And then the Taba papers that uh, we were the last uh, attempt where Europeans were on the round table and the round and the table negotiation and trying to give certain support and, and testimony to the peace in the region. So um, Europe cannot, uh, you know, look to the region and considering they have no the capacity to influence, you know. On the contrary, I think uh, it's my own experience. When I was representing the whole European Union, I can tell all of you that I found myself with a tremendous moral and ethic and political support, understanding that when Europeans are united and they defend uh, rightly and in a, let's say, uh, concrete manner, uh, our intervention are always successful. When we are divided and we consider that we cannot play our own role, that we have to wait for others to decide by our own self, is when we found these uh, Europeans uh, being uh, put uh, outside and being not considered in, in the appropriate manner. So uh, I'm still considered that Europe and now after the election in the United States, and uh, I hope the opening for a new chapter in the negotiation process between Israel and Palestinian, that Europe should really play a much more uh, important role. I mean, I'm not going to be, you know, trying to substitute anybody. We need everybody. We need, of course, the United States leading role, but we need other actors to be also part of preparing the environment for the two sides, the Palestinian and Israeli, to sit together and make the final compromise in order to achieve peace. So um, I'm still optimistic in this sense. Let's hope that uh, the new US administration will take the lead on this uh, new effort and then find uh, ourselves uh, 30 years after Madrid Peace Conference that opened the chapter, the book for peace in the region, 30 years later, we could have, you know, in 2021, a year of a final agreement between Israel and Palestine. So I now uh, start my introductory remark. I'm going to give uh, the floor to uh, Deborah first, then Eli Barnaby, and then Elias Sambar. Uh, and I'm not the one who will put your question, but uh, if you ask me what question I would put to you, I will have uh, uh, three that is uh, only one, but uh, is uh, the, your own perception of how it should be the role of uh, Europe in the Middle East, what had been in the past and what should be in the future. Uh, second one is, uh, 
uh, um, you are still considering um, that uh, the two-state solution uh, is the, the best solution for peace, uh, sustainable peace in the region. And third, in order that we enter in this uh, double track recognition, of course, how we handle this uh, so-called Abrahamic solution or normalization of the recent uh, recognition for Arab countries to Israel. At the same time, when uh, others will uh, recognize Palestine uh, uh, as a state, because if we want a two-state solution, we need that international community recognize the two states. So that is my my introductory and my uh, suggested uh, question. So, uh, Deborah, the floor is yours. Uh, so, uh, thank you for coming to this uh, webinar, and we are, of course, uh, absolutely uh, thanks for your participation. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me and for this opportunity to, to share my thoughts on peace in the Middle East, especially at this um, fortuitous time when we seem to all be on the cusp of um, the possibility of major transformations. Um, I wanted to share my condolences on the passing of Saeb Arakat. Uh, I actually met him one time uh, when in Jerusalem in 1990 doing my doctoral research on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And uh, he was so kind to give a, a poor graduate student like me um, an hour of his time to help me understand the role of the media in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict at that very critical time in the 1990s. So it was very, very sad to hear of his passing. Um, in the summer of 2019, I paid a visit to the graves of Shimon Paris and of um, Itzhak Rabin. And I now carry with me the, the memory of um, Saeb Arakat and recognizing that the one message I have today is that um, we all need to take risks for peace. And I think that um, what we see um, more infrequently today is um, a leadership that's willing to put their life on the line to advance the peace process. And we seem to have made the biggest leaps forward when uh, leaders have made like potentially um, sort of fatal compromises uh, to advance the pre peace process, whether it's Sadat or Begin or uh, Rabin um, or even Yasser Arafat. So that would be a message that I would have. Um, I want to share some slides because I think that my other co-panelists will have much more to say about the actual negotiations of a Palestinian-Israeli settlement based on their areas of expertise. Um, but I have um, always tried to think about the context in which that negotiation takes place. And my fear is that right now, the Middle East is in such disarray that the Palestinian Israeli issue gets placed to the side. And that I think is, is a risk, um, but it's also um, in some ways a reality. And I think that the, um, as somebody who teaches the Palestinian Israeli conflict at a military institution, I am constantly surprised by the uh, lack of any kind of engagement with the issue by 20 to 25 year olds who are going to be serving in the United States military when they graduate. They don't know where things are on the map. They don't know who the players are. They don't know why the conflict matters or which side the United States has been on or not. And I think that that is a feature of the fact that there seem to be bigger issues that are attacking and you know, occupying their thoughts. So I wanna share a couple of slides to give a visual of what I'm talking about. First of all, I want to use this particular tile that you see on the right-hand side. I purchased that at a, a tile factory in Al Khalil uh, in 2019. And I think it carries an important message for all of us in terms of what peace means. Uh, we're not talking about everybody just sort of like having a nice sunny day and giving everybody hugs. Um, peace means to be in a place where there is you know, it doesn't mean to be in a place where there's no noise, no trouble, or no hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and to still be calm in your heart. 
and I think that um, there is an important message there about how we function within the chaos and still keeping, like uh, uh, Miguel said, the optimism for some kind of, of calm to emerge from the chaos. Um, when we're looking at um, the problems that are searching for a peaceful solution, uh, we have many intervening variables there. We have civil war, we've got the GCC crisis, we've got the uh, sort of US under the Trump administration desire to sort of push back and contain Iran, um, and now facing a transition where we need to bring Iran back in uh, to any kind of negotiations of stability in the Middle East. We've got young people uprising and protesting, uh, whether it's in Iraq or Lebanon or Sudan or Algeria, and they're angry about the fact that they don't have a voice that's being recognized, they don't have good governance, and the economy is not strong enough to allow them to transition to adulthood. And that is a, a cause for uh, destabilization. We've got climate change, food, water, and energy nexus challenges that create a context for conflict. Uh, we've got refugee crises, and this one definitely touches on Europe um, as well. Uh, we've got, um, let's see, uh, we need to locate a, a leadership that's mobilized for peace and problem solving. And what about the Kurds? They end up being sort of last on the list. Uh, they were last on my list, and I was a little bit ashamed of that when I was putting these slides together, but the Kurds do also uh, deserve to have uh, a recognition of their rights. And I think one of the problems for where we are right now is that COVID-19 and a White House in transition um, make all of these particular issues uh, particularly difficult to even think about when we have our populations all throughout Europe, the United States and the whole world facing a deadly virus, a vaccine not yet here. And we are now have a White House in transition, which I think is um, perhaps the biggest sign uh, that Europe in, is going to take a leadership role and needs to take a leadership role because the United States is going to be sitting on the bench until January and we can't afford the problems facing the Middle East are so important and so potentially detrimental that we can't afford to have um, you know leadership external leadership uh, waiting uh, for a new uh, White House to take a role. There are two questions I think that I really am interested in getting student um, opinions on and we're supposed to have a woo chat to, uh, to do that. But uh, the first one is, do you think uh, US Middle East policy will change significantly with a um, new White House? I have shared the woo clap um, poll. Students may vote now. And since I can't see the screen, I'm hoping somebody can tell me the results. <laughs> well, um, so far about 50-50, but yes and no. <laughs> okay, all right. That's, I think that's a good place to be because um, it means that uh, nobody really knows the road ahead and we are waiting to find out. Um, I think that uh, Biden has already made statements about all of the decisions he's going to make quite rapidly to roll back the Trump administration. Um, he said that he, he's planning to reinstate the um, Iran agreements. Uh, he is going to take a, a much sort of stronger um, uh, I guess I want to say like a hand reaching across to the hands uh, of the global community and re-engaging the United States with all of the agreements, including the Kyoto Protocols and other things. So he, he's making a lot of promises about how he plans to change things, but we're going to have to see whether the, the words actually meet with um, the actions. And then if we can have the second question, uh, do you think uh, that great power competition between the US, China and Russia will lead to more peace or more war in the Middle East? We can launch that second question. The second question is on. We give a few seconds for students to submit their answers.
So far, about 20 answers and a large majority for possibly more war. Uh oh. Okay, yes, and I, I think that this is also an issue to watch. I'm not expecting like a yes or no or a definitive yes or no. Um, I think what I'm saying is that with these questions, we need to have sort of a, a wait and see, but also a hope, a hope that there will be less war and also a hope that the Biden White House will uh, take a, a leadership role in um, helping to solve some of the um, interconnected problems that I had on that screen. Um, so if I can now just conclude with what role for Europe, I think I don't need to share the slide, it's just a few words on text, but basically what it's saying that in terms of the role for Europe, I think the main issues that are facing uh, European interests are oil, migration, Islamist extremism, and containing U.S. interests or conditioning U.S. interests to make sure that there's a, a clear role and uh, recognition of European needs. And also uh, the last point I think is that if the US is pivoting to Asia, this leads an opportunity and a risk uh, for Europe in terms of taking a leadership role within the Middle East. Um, if I can just leave with three pieces of advice that I have for anybody who wants to try to solve any of those uh, problems that were on that screen uh, that I showed you, the interconnected problems of the context. Um, I have three pieces of advice. One is to do no harm the second is to take risks for peace. And the third is to let the region lead in shaping its future. And I will end my comments there. Thank you very much, Deborah, for a very interesting uh, comments. And, uh, and I will, uh, at the end, uh, try to get some of your advice and, and recommendation. Eh? in order that we get some uh, conclusion at the end of the panel. So now, Eli, uh, Barnaby, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Miguel. <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me start by uh, sharing your, uh, your sorrow for the passing away of Saeb, who was uh, uh, not only uh, a great diplomat, an accomplished diplomat, but also a, a human being and, and a gentleman. I, uh, I met him several times. And uh, when I think that uh, Trump sailed through Corona uh, and came away uh, uh, stronger than before and Saeb died, it makes me uh, sad and uh, angry at the same time. So, uh, Maybe I'll start by saying that uh, uh, by, by, by reassessing the, uh, the absolute need for a two-state solution. And I'm saying that because I'm hearing of late noises um, uh, in Europe about uh, so-called recognition of the new realities on the, on the ground. And maybe it's time to... Uh, if not to abandon the two-state solution, at least uh, to forget about it a little bit. And I think that this would be uh, a sheer catastrophe. There is no, there is simply no other solution. Uh, a one-state solution, it's a recipe for disaster, for civil war. And, uh, and I, um, uh, I, would, I would advise everybody uh, not to uh, not to think about about abandoning the two-state solution. It's the the only one possible. And now to uh, to our to our topic: Europe and the uh, uh, peace in the Middle East. Well, as uh, Miguel knows better than anybody here, it's a well-worn subject of peacemaking. I have been hearing about. Europe and the role of Europe in the Middle East and the peace process for years and years and years. And nothing, nothing ever changed. And now, maybe now, the international and regional context may make it relevant. Maybe now it's time for a real European role in the Middle East. The US is out of the race for the time being 
Deborah said it, I think she's perfectly right. It will be, it will take time before, before the Americans will, uh, will think about engaging again in the Middle East. Russia has other fish to fry in its immediate neighborhood. And the sunny states must show something from themselves after the rush to normalize ties with, with Israel. And Europe may be now the only entity capable of playing a role. The first question is, of course, which Europe? What we Europe are we talking about when we, when we say Europe? So certainly not all of the European Union. I think the Czechs and the Poles and the Hungarians, uh, we can't really uh, rely on them. Um, what I'm thinking about is a coalition of the willing, meaning a group of member states led by France, plus the UK, Norway, maybe Switzerland, a coalition of the winning. And if such a coalition can emerge, I would mention six principles for immediate action. And I'm sorry to be so pragmatic, but I think that this is one of the, one of the aims of our, of our gathering. Six principles. First, start from the assumption that Europe no longer intends to be the cash drawer of a peace process from which it is absent, and now wants to play the role of honest broker, which the US have, has given up, and in fact, which it has never really played. Second, produce a Venice Declaration too. Miguel reminded us the Venice Declaration of 1980. It's about time to publish a new Venice Declaration, articulating the fundamental principles of the European Union concerning its vision of peace in the Middle East. Third, draft a European peace plan based on the two-state paradigm with a clear timetable. No need here to, re to reinvent the wheel. It is enough to adopt the Clinton parameters and develop them, taking as a model, for, for, for example, the Geneva Accords. Fourth, draw up a roadmap and create an international coalition composed mainly of the main Arab actors, such as Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf states, to support it. Fifth, convene immediately afterwards an international peace conference organized by the EU with like-minded states to relaunch negotiations between the parties on the basis of the peace plan and the roadmap. And six, recognize the state of Palestine and its sovereignty in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and in Jerusalem as the jury participant in peace negotiations and support the full membership of the state of Palestine in the United Nations. This to reduce the enormous disparity between the parties. Now, I heard that we are still waiting for the leadership of the United States so said Miguel. I, I think it's a, it's a kind of uh, Pavlovian reflex. I mean, when you, when, when you think about the peace process in the Middle East, we think automatically of the United States as the leader of the process. Well, I think it's about time for Europe to take the lead because the Americans won't do it. They may join, they may lead from behind as Obama said in another context, but they won't do it. Um, so I think that if, if Europe is interested in what's going on in the Middle East, and I think it is, I mean, Miguel is perfectly right. The Middle East is part of Europe. It, it's, it's, par it's of paramount importance for its own well-being from all points of view. 
historical, political, geopolitical, whatever. If Europe really wants to do something, it's about time for it to do it. I didn't mention other, other uh, aspects which are important in, in themselves. For instance, the, the enormous question of the differentiation between the sovereign territory of Israel and the occupied territories, which you know, Europe recognizes, it, but it's, it's done in a, such a stuttering way. Uh, it's about time to do, to really differentiate between the two and to take measures in order to uh, to see to see to it that you, that uh, that uh, any involvement of Europe with Israel leaves the occupied territories aside. But this is another aspect, which is a matter of of immediate policy. What I what I I am aiming at is to take these six principles. They are not they are not the the Torah from Sinai, as we say. They can be they can be adjusted. They can be modified. But I think. We have here a plan of action, which uh, which is susceptible to do something. And believe me, if Europe takes this time, if a significant coalition of the willing uh, uh, takes upon itself to do this, we listen. Nobody will be able to say we are not interested. Uh, it's uh, it, it's something that uh, people don't really don't really understand. Israel speaks very hotly and very highly, but Europe is of enormous importance for Israel. We cannot ignore Europe. And I think that some kind of, of involvement, determined, clear, friendly, of course, uh, can have an enormous, an enormous impact. Thank you very much. Thank you, extremely uh, encouraging and uh, a very imaginative proposal. I will come back to that, uh, Eli. Eh? Uh, we have you in front of negotiation and <laughs> I think we will be more easy to get a final agreement, but uh, uh, we have to, to see how we can make it. So now Elias, uh, Elias uh, Sambar, please, uh, my dear friend. Thank you, thank you, Miguel. Uh, I have to, to point some uh, elements before addressing the question. The first one is an homage to my brother, Saad Arikat, whom I met, uh, and today I was very, very moved by this uh, souvenir, whom I met uh, in 1991, in 1991, when uh, in charge of preparing the files for the negotiations. I uh, went with some of our brothers and sisters from Amman in Jordan, where we did gather, to the uh, bank of the Jordan River from the Jordanian side. And uh, when we waited for a bus with uh, Faisal Husseini and the whole of the delegation coming from Palestine, and we made the first junction for us refugees, I will, I'm, a, I'm a child refugee from 48, for the first time in 1991, between the Palestine of the exile and Palestine in Palestine. And then we flew all together, we came back to Amman and went to Madrid. And we never uh, 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 stopped being very, very good friends. I, I've seen him every, every, every single uh, occasion of negotiations or on the um, uh, official visits of uh, uh, the President Arafat, then uh, of uh, President Abu Mazen to Paris and, uh, and, and other missions. Uh, and my last contact was uh, just the day he went to Hadassah, the hospital. I'll never forget our conversation. I told him, Saab, you, you don't have to call me. You, you, you are in a very, very difficult uh, situation. And uh, I'll never forget the, the words he told me, repeated. You cannot imagine how tired I am. I'm so tired, I'm so tired. That was the, our last conversation. So we, we're really very, very sad, not only because of the loss, the political loss, not only because of the example he, he, he gave, uh, never, never, never despair never, never being desperate, 
about the, the question of achieving a real, I, I won't even use the word of peace, but reconciliation, because this is the main issue. The, the peace of the hearts, not only the peace on diplomatic uh, documents. And he, he, was, he has been following this. So uh, it's a loss, it's a real loss, it's a personal loss, and it, it's a loss for Palestine, for his people. I have now to address the issue of Europe. I did, I was part of this process for 30 years. And I'm since uh, 16 years now representing, having the honor to represent Palestine at UNESCO. We have no problem with the positions of the Europeans. The positions are really advanced positions. The principles are respected. They remind, the Europeans remind us every time they can of the principles. And this is very good. My, our problem is with the action, not the principles, not the positions, but the action. We see no action. And I would want to, just to try to tell you why, in my opinion, action is very difficult. It's difficult, first of all, because of a rule that is sometimes, uh, we are friends, so we have, we have to say things very frankly, that sometimes are used as alibi, not, not a real argument, which is, you know, we Europeans cannot move if we don't have a consensus. And within the 27 members, you will always have a country that will say, no, I do not, I do not agree. And then you'll say, you see, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot take the move. But this is not the main problem. The main problem lies, in my opinion, and this is my experience in the procedures. Very, very soon in the negotiation, in the process, a frame was elaborated, which is the quartet. This frame was due to be the receptacle of the negotiations with the US, Russia, UN, Europe. And from the very beginning, the US said, we have the monopoly within the consensus of the political issue. Their argument was very simple. It was this following one. You know, the Israelis won't listen to any other partner. So if you want efficiency, you have to concede that we, are, we hold the political issue and all the visions, and then they, they called it an a, a honest broker, and it wasn't very honest. There were no broker. So the negotiations were due to be, to be within the quartet, but in fact, there were a tete-a-tete -tete completely tete-a-tete -tete between the Palestinians, the Israelis, and the Americans on the table. So, and I follow Eli uh, uh, on this point, we need, we need to have a table, not excluding the Americans, but with some other important partners on the table. This is what we need from Europe. Europe has also accepted to be reduced to the role of the financing partner. Europe is the main, main, main partner that helps the Palestinians on the, on the, uh, on the uh, financial level. And they have accepted this and Palestinians are very thankful to the Europeans because otherwise everything would have collapsed. But we don't understand why Europe doesn't ask for a political weight in exchange of all the money of its citizens, because these, these are the, 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 the uh, and Pope, that it puts and pours within the Palestinian situation. It has now, uh, it is confronted, I think now, to a very uh, a paradox. Europe, by helping the Palestinian without taking the, 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 the panel to say this is what should be done, is indirectly it is not the intention of the Europeans, financing the perpetuation of the occupation, because they don't ask for their money. The Americans know how to. So we need, we need a table with many, many, many partners. 
We also need a, 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 a auto critique on the Palestinian side. I have to be honest, and I cannot only uh, say what I do not uh, 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 appreciate from other sides. I have to say what I do not appreciate from my side. We did fall in the trap because we did consolidate the fact that the only interlocutor should be the US. We've always, always put all our eggs in one basket. And I remember a conversation, I was, I was back from a, a session of negotiations with uh, the, uh, uh, Hubert Védrin, who was the uh, French uh, uh, foreign ambassador at that time. He told me, you're, you're very, very strange people. You know, when, when you are in impasse, you come running to us. But whenever you see that the Americans have just opened the door, you run to the States and you forget what you did ask for from us. You don't give us. So we, we, we didn't play the, the what we should have played. This has to be said. This has to be said. I remember many, I, I remember some, also a conversation with the, the a man, a, a diplomat, who was the head of the uh, uh, Bureau Diplomatique under President uh, Sarkozy at the Elysee. They played, I don't want to enter into detail, they played a very important role in the vote of France for the admission of Palestine as a, a full member of UNESCO. They did take a risk because as you, you, you certainly know, uh, uh, Miguel, it was a very, very hard battle. And they said, we're going to have some demands at the UN. And then I met him. He told me, you know, you're, you're very strange people. I say, why? He said, nous, I'll translate it. Nous sommes montés dans l'avion. Nous nous sommes retournés. Mais vos sièges étaient vides. We, we went on the plane. We look in our bags and realize that your seats were empty. You did leave us after you got from us the vote. So one has to be very, very clear on all these issues. So we need action. We need to, to say, if we are so important in order to maintain the Palestinian Authority alive, I mean financially, not, not its people is alive. We, we need to have a place to say our demands, our perceptions and our aims. And I think there are two principles that Europe can, can, can use, which, which, which they can be very efficient. The, t, the two concepts are the following. The first one is the simultaneity. And the second one is reciprocity, which is if you want to achieve practical steps, whenever Israel takes a step on the settlements, for example, Palestinians will take a step. But the order of sequence is crucial simultaneously. Otherwise, Palestinians will keep saying Israel doesn't doesn't honor and, and, and fulfill its promises. And Israel will say, we cannot have any confidence in the Palestinians because as soon as we open some things, they, 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 the violence come back, etc. We have We need to have these two principles. And we need uh, now that there are some, some words about a, a conference that should, international conference, I, I'm sure you've heard about it, that should be uh, 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 held in uh, Moscow in January. I'm, I'm not very optimistic about it. I'm just telling you what, what we, we know. Uh, that if this can happen, what would be the mean for Europe to say to Israel, you should be there. We're not asking you to change your positions. We're not asking you to, 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 to have another language than your language, but you have to be there. And we have a very, very negative experience when Francois Hollande in Paris some years ago convened a meeting of the same type 
And the agenda was really very interesting. But as the days would run, there were every day a change in the agenda. And at the end of the game, they told us we cannot have an agenda if we are not sure that Israel will accept to attend. And that at the end of the game, the, the agenda was really empty. And nothing, nothing, nothing emerged from this meeting. So again, we, we want Europe to be there. I'm critical, but because we want Europe to be a partner. We need, it's, it's very important for us. It's crucial not to be on tete a tete of the table because the balance of power is not, is not uh, 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 possible for us. There is an occupier, there is an occupied. That, that's the, the, so we need, we need a, a semblant, a kind of balance of a, 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 an equilibre between the, 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 the partners. And we need, I think, these principles of simultaneity and reciprocity. Voilà, merci. Thank you very much, uh, Elias, because also their world of uh, reconciliation and trying to find a way to move forward. And I think you have uh, put on the agenda. I, I myself uh, suffer what you say, the way uh, the Palestinians were asking me to play a role. And then immediately when the Americans were, uh, you know, opening the way, they say, well, Miguel, they stay out, you know, but uh, I tried to get in, even if they didn't allow me to get on, you know. Anyhow, I think we are very short of time. So I think, uh, uh, Deborah, you, I think you can take the role now, uh, because as a professor, you have more experience than me, to moderate the, the question and answer from a student. So I ask you, you take the, the lead, and, and then we try to condensate the question, and then I will have a a final comment. Unfortunately, we have so many things to say, but the time is going very quickly. So, um, uh, Deborah, the, okay. the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And it's been so enriching to hear all of these super smart, very connected and involved and historic figures talk about the future of Europe and a peace in the Middle East. Um, the students have asked a number of questions. There are um, some dovetailing of the questions. And so I've tried to take them all down and to summarize them into three main issues that hopefully the panelists can respond to. Um, the first is with regards to um, the two-state solution. Um, and uh, the students would like us to think about what are the alternatives to the two-state solution. And that it's perhaps that with some new thinking, uh, new action towards peace might be possible. Um, and then another student asks a very interesting question. And he said, the United States is always like pomp and circumstance uh, and Trump's you know, deal of the century. Um, so there's a lot of sort of hype of US ideas for solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and then very little delivery. So there's more words than there are actions. And so the student asks, might Europe take a more quiet diplomacy, you know, diplomatic approach uh, towards creating like real action? And I was immediately struck by this question to think about the Norwegian role during the Oslo peace process, where they just kind of got people in a room and like basically, I think what I read was not let them leave until there was some kind of an agreement. Um, and still that that survives as the, the principle uh, for peace that we're working on that Clinton built on, et cetera. And then the third issue is, you know, why are the Kurds always last? And can Europe take a, a better, more active role to sort of promote and protect Kurdish interests and, and um, aspirations, and then use that as kind of a dual track for Palestinian and Kurdish um, solutions to their national aspirations at the same time. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, I give first the floor to Elia Elias, and then uh, I will comment myself, but uh, I think, uh, Eli, you have the, uh, well, I think you mentioned about the two-state solution. I fully agree with you, but uh, go ahead. Yes. So is there an alternative to uh, to the two-state solution? As I, as I said before, 
that is none. I mean, when when you when you look at the people who defend this uh, so-called solution of one-state solution, they are all on the extreme left or the extreme right. A one-state solution is to put together two uh, two nations, of which one will be that's the human nature will be dominant. Um, it's the uh, it's the end of the uh, of the national aspirations of both nations. It as I said, it's a recipe for uh, for a perpetual civil war. Uh, it's not by chance that uh, the the two state solution has been proposed for the for the first time in the thirties in 1937 uh, by the by, by the British having having stated that there are two nations in Palestine, the only reasonable outcome is the partition. And this partition has been accepted by the international community in 1947, and then uh, reaffirmed once and again. The, this is the only solution on the cards. So, so please uh, drop the idea that uh, to, to put together uh, two, uh, two national movements, two nations, that are that are hungry for uh, for uh, for the national dignity. I mean, this is the last thing we need. So that's why I don't think that there is a, 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 a another an alternative to this. Talking about the re-election, I mean, the uh, the Oslo process. It's a, it's a, it's a one shot. You know, <laughs> it, it started in secret, but it became, of course, it became it became uh, it, it came into the open. You can't have a solution only by negotiating in the shadows. You need somehow to translate what you negotiate uh, into into practical terms. The practical terms are always public. To what what I really think is this real station, the real action, must be public, must be open, and must have a kind of mechanism of uh, of uh, of sticks and carrots. I mean, people need to pay for their for their mistakes, and people need to to uh, to assess the limits to their action. If you want to colonize the Palestinian territories, please do. But there is a price to, to be paid. Actually, we never paid a price for colonization, never. And that's in this kind of uh, silence of, uh, of the international community, we continue to, uh, to colonize the, the territories, making the solution more and more difficult. Uh, I, 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 if, if you don't do that, we go nowhere. It's very important to understand. We, we need to have a system of, uh, of international responsibility. And that's the, the aim of Europe. I, 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 Europe, uh, Europe could have the means to do this. They never did. For, for historical reasons, we don't have time to discuss it, but it would be it would be interesting to get into the psychological historical reasons why Europe is so weak. Part of it is because it's, it's not organized. They say they don't speak in one voice. Part of it because it's very difficult for them to get to get into do in, in, into this matter for for historical and psychological reasons. Well, the Kurds is not really they are not an, unfortunately not not an example. I mean, if, if we if we follow the example of the Kurds, there will never be a Palestinian state. And, and mingle the two, it's not a recipe for the Kurds and not, nor for the Palestinians. It's another international historical and moral scandal what happened to the, to the Kurds, but it's a different, a different seminar. Thank you, Eli, uh, Elias. Uh, yes. What, uh, what do you answer to the two, three questions? Today. Today, if you look at the landscape, the possibility of the two states are impossible. You just have to unfold a map, look very specifically on it, and you'll see that it cannot, you don't see how, even if the principle is admitted, how you could implement it. 
Nevertheless, this is the only solution possible, despite the maps, despite the reality, despite the evolution of the settlements, the fact that they are putting their hands on more and more and more land, but nevertheless, this is the only solution. And this is the only solution today, even more than, than before, when you have some Arab states that who went in normal, what they call normalization. It's very good. Some people could critic, the other could applaud, but at the end of the game, there is one very single question. When an Israeli open his window, who, whom does, it, does he seize? Who is in the landscape? It isn't the citizens of the Emirates or the citizens of Bahrain or he'll see Palestinians who are there. And today, and I'm not using this element as a threat. I don't like this type of threats. But today in what you, we call historical Palestine, which is the, the borders under the British mandate, we, are, we have 50% Palestinians, 50% Israelis. Today, not in the future. So this is the issue. There is no other issue. They can normalize whenever with whom they want. This is the issue. And the issue is why the only issue acceptable is the two states. Because this is what I've been defending for years in negotiations and in, in, in discussions. The only way to achieve reconciliation is a transitory period where we could have the possibility of elaborate what I call an art du voisinage, art of neighborhood. We cannot, we want, the, the conflict has been uh, going on for years, for, for one century. And you cannot just say, well, we're going to, to do things together, everybody love everybody, this is not true. We need this transition within the two states to give sovereignty, I go back to the, to, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 simultaneity and, and uh, reciprocity. Both, both entities, both states, both people, both society feel that they have got their rights. And then we can elaborate, not a mixture, but a new way of being neighbors. Then reconciliations will come or not. This is not the problem then of a treaty or no treaty. So we need it. We, don't, we have no other, sol other solutions are war. No other solution despite the difficulty. Today, somebody will tell me, what are you talking about? This is very unrealistic. What, what are you saying? Look at the maps, look at the settlements, look at the bypass roads, look. But I think there is no other way out. It's unfortunate, it's very difficult. It seems irrealistic, but we have no other way to. That's why I think, to go back to Europe, that we should, or Europe, I'm not European, uh, uh, should play on one, one issue. I had a very good friend who was very, very Zionist, but who was a, a, a man of, of justice. His name was Zeev Sternel, very important historian of the right in France. Sternel told me, you know what is the difficulty within the Israeli society? The difficulty is that you have a real majority that wants to have the two states because they realize this is the only way possible to live and Israelis are normal people like we are normal people. We are human beings. But he told me the settlements or the settlers did uh, uh, succeed in saying or putting the society facing a very difficult choice. You choose. You want to give the Palestinian territory to the Palestinians, then it's civil war. You don't want civil war, you stay calm, quiet, you don't talk, and you accept what is going on on the, on the ground. The society is confronted, I think, to this issue, which is very, very dangerous. And that's why you have a paralysis 
within the, the Israeli society. Not, not because as we hear uh, the peace camp is dead. No, 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 no. The, 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 the paralysis comes from this issue. We have the choice, choose. And this shows how much the settlers have gained in terms of power with, within Israel. And we, we know how, they are, how, how much they are implanted in the, the present uh, government and in the Knesset. So these are the issues, but um, again and again, you, 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 you were quoting the goal or the, the idée simple. My idée simple is very simple. When you open your window, who do you see? <laughs> Do you see the Sheikh of Qatar or the Sheikh of... No, no. You see me. This is, this is the issue. Well. Thank you very much, Elias. Uh, I think, Deborah, you can also answer the question you put to, to the panelists uh, because you are also a panelist. So I don't know if you want to may answer what the student uh, uh, asked you. I just wanted to share some thoughts based on um, some summer of 2019 ethnographic work I did um, in Israel and in the West Bank. And I went with the question of what, you know, where did the idea that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East come from? And is there still any commitment to democracy going on? And what I found uh, was, um, more importantly, the creation of a one state solution, the, the difference was Palestinians were absent. And my fear with just maintaining the idea of the two state is the only solution and, and hoping that somehow it will really merge. In the meantime, people who have a, a very much more right wing solution are winning and, and they're not talking, they're actually acting. And I was absolutely astounded. I'll give you an example of, of what's happening to the Palestinian voice. Um, I wanted to um, meet with some of the sort of Palestinian organizations that are working on you know, a two-state solution. And all of them have been pushed out of East Jerusalem and you have to go to Ramallah to get to even meet with anybody. Um, in the same time, B'Tselem, you know, Israeli human rights organization. I wanted to go and meet with some people from there and nobody would meet with me. They said, if you need any information, it's on our website. And, and so the, the basic point is the left has collapsed and it's disappeared and it's afraid to speak out because of the consequences within Israeli society. The Palestinians have been pushed into, you know, behind, behind the fence, so to speak. And the other thing I observed is like the Russification of, of Israel. And that I can give you examples, like when you go down south to uh, Beersheba or even down to Elat, you have all of these grocery stores that have massive pig heads in the, de in the case, the deli case. So that, you know, and walls of vodka. <laughs> and, and as a part of that process, we've had a, less of a commitment to the Judaism of the state, right? And a rise in nationalism. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you look at South Africa, if you look at uh, Northern Ireland, those are conflicts where you have a one state solution and you find that that's the only way to create reconciliation. I think the risk of a one state solution from an Israeli point of view, whether you're left or right, is that the Jewish nature of the state is annihilated. And the basic point is that the state was created to create a place where Jews could be a majority in their own state and have sovereignty. And so until you're willing to relinquish that principle, you can't even think about a one state solution as an alternative. But then again, on the ground, go and look at what's happened to East Jerusalem. The borders between East and West Jerusalem don't exist anymore. The electric train has taken care of that. Uh, uh, business, uh, Palestinians that used to shop in East Jerusalem or work in East Jerusalem now working in West Jerusalem and traveling back and forth between the two cities. So you've integrated Jerusalem under Israeli control. And it's a, it's a one capital solution. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that I think the idea of a two state solution made sense in the 80s and the 90s. 
and I, I right now it, it's an excuse for waiting for history to make itself. And in the end, we get a one state solution without the Palestinians present. And that I think is more risky than the compromises you would make to try to create um, reconciliation within a state where everybody has a right and everybody is a part of democracy. <laughs> anyway, that's probably like a big bomb to place right here. <laughs> so I okay, want to okay. comments. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Deborah. I think uh, we are running out of time. Uh, can, so, can I please? Uh, yes. Can I elaborate on the on what Deborah said? Of course, Elias. Yes. Very, very, very quickly. The, the, the problem is that nobody is defining what one state solution means. Many people think that one state solution means democracy for all, equal rights, and citizenship. This is not the case. This might happen, but after years of apartheid, one state solution today means apartheid. Are we, are we willing to go into this experience after one, one century of problems and fights and, and martyrs? Are we willing to go into this? Isn't the two-state solution a better way to achieve something? Now, I know my, my, I know my people. What I say it seems to be absolutely unrealistic. And even some people will tell me you're very stupid, not only unrealistic. But there is no other way. It's very difficult. It's an obstacle. There is an impasse. But at the end of the game, today, a one-state solution for the Israelis means the end. It's for the Israelis. This is not my problem. But this is their, their, their project. means the end of the Jewish state. And for us, means years of new apartheid. This is what it means if you want to be very concrete. And this is the problem. We are we are in an impasse. I won't deny it. Merci. Just one okay, word, uh, Miguel. One word because I yeah, think one word. Yes, because we are running out of time. It, uh, okay. What, what uh, Elias says is perfectly right. But this is one possibility. Apartheid. The other is civil war, and the two can go together very well. This. Is so this what, what is said before that we need a period of time of taking, you know, of, of growing together side by side, which means sovereignty. And then in the long run, having a kind of formula of, of, uh, of confederation, which is, which is the, a, a, realistic, a realistic possibility, but this will take time. For the time being, you, we must heal. And this is very important. That's why the idea of one state, it's, it, it's crazy. It, it, it's really a criminal idea. And this must be understood for, everybody, especially for our, from our friends. Well, thank you very much to all of you. I think we had a very interesting debate. Uh, I want to tell to the students uh, that they are the main audience of today, that what you have uh, witnessed today is the positive, uh, optimist, uh, reasonable uh, view of how to deal with the Middle East. So, um, but at the same time that there are people in both sides, in Palestine, in Israeli side, that are uh, working for peace and understanding the complexity, the need for making action. So mm, not everything is lost, on the contrary. I think what uh, we had been uh, witnessing during the last decade mainly was a kind of uh, fatalism, a kind of pessimism that would not allow us to move forward because we think, well, it's not going to work. Uh, peaceful, peace is uh, impossible. That, uh, Deborah, is what we can, you say. And I agree fully with uh, both uh, Eddie and Elias about the two-state solution. Now they are trying to present to us that as the two-state solution is difficult, it's an existential moment for the, this, uh, this formula. Let's go to move to one state solution. But one state solution, I fully agree with Eli, is going for having not only apartheid, but even the full confrontation. So don't get into this trap, thinking that we have a very nice, formulated democratic uh, citizenship for everybody. That is a simple idea. That doesn't reflect the complexity of the situation. So just to conclude, 
let me uh, thank all of you. Uh, thank uh, Deborah for asking us to take risk. I think uh, time is for taking risk to show leadership. Uh, thank you for uh, both of you and even Deborah to ask for the Europeans to make uh, you know a, a much more active role. And thank you, Eddie, for giving us six um, recommendations, your plan of action, uh, your idea of having maybe the coalition of willing is a very good one. Uh, thank you, Elias uh, Sambar, for these uh, two principles, simultaneously and reciprocity. And thank you for uh, uh, asking Europe to move forward. Uh, it is true because I found myself in this situation when I try to move along, the Palestinians and Israel say, well, we need the Americans. But today we have already proved within the last uh, two or three decades that uh, the US alone cannot solve the problem. We need the United States, but we need others to participate in this uh, common effort. And I think uh, the quarter have to be revived. We have to change the process, but I mean, what we need is a political will that uh, this leadership will come, come back to the European uh, headquarters. We cannot uh, uh, accept, and uh, Deborah was very clear when she put uh, in this uh, graphic the interests of Europe in the region. So if uh, foreign policy is to defend the uh, interests why Europe is not defending their interests? What we are complaining about, uh, you know, energy, what we are complaining about migration, what are complaining about refugees, what are complaining about radicalism and terrorism, if we don't intervene. So the problem, how we European leaders understand that the stake of inter Europe is playing in the Middle East. So maybe it's an opportunity now. Maybe we have this open way to intend to, 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 to try to really move forward. So I hope uh, students have uh, get some uh, positive um, elements of this uh, conversation. We will have uh, so many time to, to go into the details. Uh, thank you very much. I think at least um, I'm sure the uh, a lot of uh, young people will mobilize themselves. We need mobilization action. Uh, we have to ask your government through democratic process that they have to get much more involved. I know there are some uh, think tanks in the Sciences Po, sine qua non, right to us. Other think tanks have to mobilize for peace. And I think um, the best homage today we can have to our dear friend Saib is what we have discussed today. We are mobilized for peace, the peace that our uh, dear South tried to achieve. And we are going to give him this uh, final legacy because he deserved that. So thank you very much and uh, maintain engaged as we have been during the last uh, 30 years. Thank you very much and bye-bye and since New York.